My dad is a really successful entrepreneur and he always taught me that a wise man learns from his own mistakes, but a super wise man learns from the mistakes of others, right? So I learned from a lot of my own mistakes during that time, you know, also fixing a lot of issues from other providers in the practice along with that plastic surgeon. And it's just kind of evolved, you know, over the last eight years or so. We're so excited to have you. Oh, this is going to be so fun. Awesome. Thanks again for getting on. I know you've had a full work day and in your time zone, you've kind of had to rush to get on. So we appreciate it. It means a lot. You guys, it's been such a busy day. I didn't even have time to put my eyelashes on. So here's the real me. The real Shelby. (laughs) The the, the OG right here. I was like, okay, how am I going to introduce you? But you really don't need an introduction. Everybody knows who... The aesthetic injector is or Shelby Miller, but we kind of feel like we have royalty. One of my friends always says something like, don't ever meet your heroes in person because you'll be disappointed because they're just people too. But I'll tell you guys, like, if you ever get a chance to go see Shelby speak or train with her, go because however she is online, like she's just as awesome in person and so genuine. And just, um, I think just you're like 10 crazy. times. Just as crazy in person. Oh yeah. Just as crazy. Just as fun. Just like say crazy things. So. Anyhow, but we're glad you're here. And what is something that you think everyone in the industry should stop doing? Oh, that's a loaded question. I think everyone should stop looking at what everyone else is doing. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was don't look at the herd. Just be your own person, you know? And I think a lot of people see someone do something on social media and think, oh my gosh, I should be doing that. And then they try to do it and then it looks unnatural or disingenuous or, you know, just not like what they should be doing for their brand. So I think that's important to just figure out what you're passionate about, what is driving you, why you're doing what you're doing and go with that instead of just trying to, you know, look around and see what everybody's doing. That's something that I honestly never do. I really, I never look at the competition. I I always just kind of keep the eye on the prize and keep the vision of of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, and that's kind of what pushes me forward. Have you noticed that in the industry? I think a lot of people are just trying to like do what other people are doing instead of just being their own being their own person. Yeah. Doing their own thing. I, I think in the industry, but just in general, especially with social media, but I totally agree with you. I was thinking like, because people always know like if you're room of dances and I was thinking like if some of us try to do the dances. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wouldn't work out at all. So I don't really get it. But no, and like what you said, keeping your eyes on the prize, it's kind of like the whole Michael Phelps, um, you know, looking straight ahead and not your competition. Yeah. 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 No, it's so true. One of the things I think probably you're known for as your under eye technique is what you call your signature, I guess, yes. signature service that you offer. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and like how you came um, to do that? Sure. Yeah. So I actually started working while my first nursing career was actually working intensive care. We were covering open heart surgeries and pulmonary procedures and vascular procedures, and then ended up transitioning to working with a couple body plastic surgeons. I was always interested in plastics and um, I actually wanted to be a CRNA. So I uh, made that decision. We can all tell you. <laughs> What's that? What to do is, I say all of the CRNAs on here can say you made the right decision to I do, know. go your path. Well, I started okay, so I started working for a couple of body plastic surgeons, and um, I I was pumped because I I wanted to do anesthesia for plastics. That was like my end game, you know. And then I start working in the OR, and I'm like, is anyone else dying of boredom, or is it just me? It was not for me. I think I'm such a people person, and all you have is the surgeon and the surge tech. I, it was, I was so bored all day long. I, I was devastated too, because that was my vision. You know, that was what I was supposed to be doing. Um, but I met an amazing um, injector who was also a CRNA and we started, we, she was a, she would rotate in the OR and this is almost a decade ago. And she would show me pictures of um, her before and afters and I remember just being so amazed that she could create such incredible results with gel. Like my mind was blown what filler could do. So I kind of pivoted and started working for a facial plastic surgeon in his OR and um, was his main nurse, ran the whole thing and um, was in on tons of blepharoplasties, tons of facelifts and rhinos and implants, lipo, all the things. 
So I think I had a a leg up early on with anatomy getting pretty comfortable because this surgeon was a phenomenal surgeon. Um, But at the time, not, not the greatest injector. He would have a patient come in in clinic and be kind of annoyed that he had to do their filler and he would slam like eight syringes in in three minutes just wow. plowing filler into people's faces so of course there's all these people that came back and were unhappy so um he'd be like no big deal come see our nurse she's our lead injector she'll take care of you so i'm now the person in charge of handling all of these issues he did tons of under eye filler. He would go in subdermal and with a cannula and just glaze and fill the whole thing up. Um, huge problem. So I kind of learned what not to do. <laughs> Is that a good way to say it? Um, I had to fix a lot of issues, whether it was product related, depth related, um, patient selection, um, anatomy, figuring out what was going on, lymphatics. Um, so I actually just had to really dive into the, uh, research and try to figure out what was going on. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have almost quit injecting when things go wrong, but I've almost quit like three or four times now because your patients come back. I mean, they leave looking beautiful, but then they come back looking like Quasimodo, like swollen Uh and like, especially around the eyes, there's so many things that can go wrong. And I remember just this beautiful patient, her husband plays for the NBA. She's like a bombshell Victoria's Secret model. Gorgeous. Comes back looking like I completely destroyed her upper face, like swollen, puffy under eyes, lymphatics. It was so bad. And I'm like, what are we even doing? Why are we doing filler there? This is not because I injected her how that surgeon had taught me. It was so bad. So at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm either quitting or I need to figure out how to do this in a way where it's like not harmful for my patients. So um, I created a couple of relationships with um, oculoplastics, um, really tried to understand the anatomy around the eye and um, created my technique that I've kind of evolved a little bit um, over the last few years because as you continue to learn, uh, as I got an ultrasound especially, um, I've kind of tweaked the technique a little bit, but the foundation is is very much the same. You know, I think um, my dad is a really successful entrepreneur and he always taught me that a wise man learns from his own mistakes, but a super wise man learns from the mistakes of others, right? So Mm -hmm. I learned from a lot of my own mistakes during that time, you know, also fixing a lot of issues from other providers in the practice along with that plastic surgeon, and it's just kind of evolved, you know, over the last eight years or so. But um, it's it's a very complicated area to treat, you know, and I think a lot of people still don't understand it or take the time to understand it or tread lightly when you should in such an area that's very delicate with anatomy. That's kind of the story. That was a long story of how we came up with it. But I think it's helpful for people to understand. I didn't just like claim this. I think that I started fixing a lot of issues and then would post before and afters of my work and of what we had created. And people were like, oh my gosh, that looks amazing. Can you share your technique? How did you do that? And, and so started getting training requests a couple of years in, and then started just showing people how I was doing it. Like, Hey, this is how I'm doing it without getting complications. I think at this point in this industry, that's the best way to learn, right? You, you, it's such, it's such an artistic thing. You know, you really want to learn from people who create results that you think are beautiful and natural instead of just trying to figure it out on your own. Like that's not safe either or smart. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, right? I think it's important to know the history of how someone came up with the technique that they're using and have them really break it down. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's one thing that a lot of people that come to our trainings take away is like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how detailed that was. I didn't realize how intricate this technique was. I didn't realize the anatomy, the things that could go wrong, but also how easy it can be if you understand every component, because sometimes people look like they're good at what they do, right? Or you think that they're amazing and then you go to learn from them and they can't really break it down for you or explain it in a way that makes sense to you anatomically. 
that that's just how they've been doing it for so long. Right. And I, I don't think that way. I like to break it down. I like to know the why I ask the questions. I'm the annoying person that literally always raises my hand and asks, well, how thick is the orbital retaining ligament? Can we actually place products in it? Is that possible? I've seen it on a cadaver. That's what I'm trying to achieve. Is this possible? Like, I think we need to be asking more questions and we need to be treating these like medical procedures and breaking it down instead of just learning from someone who's been doing something the same way for so long. Like you have to actually break it down and understand it. So my periorbital technique is very technical and we break it down so you actually understand it. And you do a great job of that. I remember in one of your slides, you talked about how I think in uh, postmortem cases, like they've seen like where the tear trough uh, filler were actually was uh, versus where maybe we thought it was. Wasn't that part of your lecture? Sometimes you think you know where you're injecting, but actually what's mostly helpful now is scanning with the ultrasound because mm-hmm. then you actually visualize where the product is. And for example, post septal filler, are you familiar with the orbital septum? Mm-hmm. have this very thin membranous sheet, right? That acts as an anterior border of the eye. And behind that, you have your orbital fat, the fat in your orbit. The orbital septum connects to the dermis, but also the muscle. And you can so easily pop past that, which means you're going to be placing product behind this sheet into the actual orbital fat behind it, which is then going to contribute to the herniation or the bulging of the under eyes. Maybe not initially, but over time, as that HA breaks down and becomes even more hydrophilic, it creates more issues over time. So we have found incredible amounts of filler stuck behind the orbital septum on ultrasound. We've had patients that we almost referred to to plastics for a bleph. And and I'm like, "Ah, just let me like take a peek because it looks a little different. And on ultrasound, you find a significant amount of filler stuck behind the orbital septum. And I, I don't know if there's research on this, but in my mind, this makes sense. When you have filler or if you put filler in areas where your body doesn't naturally have a lot of hyaluronic acid, it doesn't know how to break it down in that area. So that filler just stays there for years and years and years. Um, there's a great article by Mobin Master that was released, I believe, in t- the end of 2021, early 2022. And um, he shows or uh, filler uh, being scanned um, via MRI, which looks different than ultrasound, but showing, it shows the same exact thing like a significant amount of post-septal filler. A bunch of their the people they scanned had had filler for years and years and the filler was still there, just stuck there. One patient, I think it was over 12 years that the product was still stuck behind the orbital septum. So yes, a lot of times we end up putting product in places that we didn't intend to. And unless you have the tools to locate that, how are you ever going to know, you know? Yeah. Are you dissolving a lot now with your ultrasound? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple of cases. Um, one really bad case. Can I screen share? I can share this with you. It's actually, yeah, absolutely. I sent this, I sent this patient for an orbits MRI because, uh, this is a video. Let me tell, I'll kind of break you down. Okay. So when you're scanning, if you start scanning, um, horizontally, so if your probes like this, you'll see bone at the bottom and it's white and it reflects the sound waves back. But if you move up, the bone drops off, right? Like where you fill that inforbital rim, the bone drops off and then you start to see the orbital fat. This bright white line is your orbital septum. So as you're scanning at the beginning of this, you can kind of see, and I'll show you, I can show you one more video that kind of shows the bone better because I'm already into the orbit on this video. So you don't really see the bone anymore underneath here because it's the orbital fat. The the bone is so deep back in the globe here. Does that make sense? You're Mm -hmm. only seeing the orbital fat. This is the orbital septum. So stuck right behind the orbital septum is this dark black glob. So that's hyaluronic acid filler stuck behind the orbital septum. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I play this video, you can see how this filler kind of extends pretty deep into the globe. 
So this one, you can kind of see me roll over the bone, I believe. So it will make more sense to you. Okay, here. So you can see the bone here. This is her bone in the mid face here. Okay, her maxilla. And then I move up and the bone drops off. So I'll slowly kind of extend this forward. I'll play it. The bone drops off and then you start to see the orbital fat do here. Do you see that there? Mm -hmm. The bone dropped off. The bone's over here now. And again, orbital septum is thin and there's this huge black glob of filler stuck behind the orbital septum. So if you have a nice enough ultrasound, this is this is from Mindray and it is pretty phenomenal. I have two different probes, really high frequency probe if you want to see a lot of detail in, this, in the dermis. Um, but this probe was just the standard probe that comes with the device and it's phenomenal. Um, you can do echocardiograms with that device. It's very strong ultrasound. You could so easily see this, but that ultrasound has this eye needle guided technology. You can kind of see this on the bottom left. If you hit that button, it allows you to really see your needle. So you can do guided injections very safely um, and pretty easily, which is nice. It's very user-friendly. Um, so I just go in either perpendicular to the probe or parallel with the probe, pop my needle right into that HA and dissolve it. Because the last video of the last patient's video extended into the orbit, I sent her for an orbit MRI because I wanted to see how much of it extended. And at some point, you just can't see all of that with ultrasound. Um, but with this, you could very easily pop past the orbital septum with a needle or a cannula. I, I typically use a cannula to dissolve these um, when you're getting close to the eye. I think it's a little bit safer. Um, but I've resolved many of them. Um, it's pretty easy, but you cannot do that without an ultrasound. You can't visualize this, right? Sure. <laughs> you can't be that precise. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. Once you get an ultrasound, I'll play the rest of this video. You can see how like extensive that filler is kind of stuck all across because it's kind of crazy. I'll pause it. You can see how it extends literally almost all the way across there. And the filler I mean, if you can pop past a, the dermis with a with a cannula, you can pop past a, a thin membranous sheet, which is your orbital septum. And it gets thinner over time as we age and more and more compromised as the patient ages and you get that fat pad that starts to herniate. So you're more and more at risk of accidentally getting behind that, um, especially on the lateral eye, if you're not respecting where that orbital retaining ligament bifurcates and you're just blowing past it. Um, that's where I found a lot of old filler kind of stuck. And it almost looks like the, the lateral part of their orbital fat is bulging, but you ultrasound it and it's like a bunch of hyaluronic acid filler just stuck there. And it's very easily to do that. that it's easy to do that with a needle because you're just you don't know where the ligament is. You don't know where your safety stopping point is. Does that make sense? If you're going mm -hmm, sure. this way with the cannula, you can fill your, your superior boundary of your ORL and don't go past that. I mean, it bifurcates. So in my courses, I teach people how to navigate that. But put simply, the ORL is your stopping point. So if you go superior to that, you are now past that orbital septum. And depending on where that's connecting to the skin or the muscle, you could be behind it just plopping filler right, right there. <laughs> and it I mean, it might look fine initially, but over time it will cause a problem. I'd say like, I don't know, 20 to 30% of the people at all of our aesthetic conferences that have like very full under eyes and look like they, they their little cats probably have a significant amount of postseptal filler because it blows out your lower eyelid completely. It's kind of wild. I think it's really important to start with um, creating that apex of the cheek, whether it's a male or a female. Um, so figure out where that is and, and really support that first because that's where they're going to get the most lift. And then I like to blend a little bit lateral and then I go medial and definitely build that anterior projection in the mid face to support the under eye. If, if your patient's on a budget, that's what you start with. Apex of the cheek, blend lateral, blend, blend medial, stop there. Um, then if you can, I start doing a little bit of the periorbital support. Majority of the product is typically needed mid pupillary. That's kind of where most of the, I find most of the deformity is um, based on 
uh, just bone and fat loss. So I always inject on bone everywhere, except for in the mid face, you're in the deep medial cheek fat. Um, otherwise you're all on bone. Um, and then I just film mid pupillary doing tiny little micro struts of product. Um, you don't want to do too much in one area, um, for lymphatics or migration and safety. Um, and then I will go into the tear trough if needed. And I actually try to place product in the tear trough ligament itself, which is tricky, but if you can get your product within the deep confines of the ligament itself, you are supporting the ligament and it lasts a long time. If you err on either side in the true tear trough, that muscle is actually interdigitated to the bone. So you are injecting in a muscle on either side of the ligament, which is okay if you're placing tiny, tiny bits of product. But over time, we all know what happens when you put product in a muscle, right? It can extend superior and end up creating like a little worm of product. So you have to be very careful about the amount. Um, we go over all of that in our training and I, I show injectors how to get into the actual tear trough ligament itself. I always use a cannula. And then from there, I always blend lateral and really help with that, that orbital malar groove, that palpable malar step off that a lot of people have because of the how kind of how tight that ORL is. And actually we know the orbital retaining ligament bifurcates and splits and you have a small little gap between there. So I show injectors how to get in between there and actually do tiny micro struts to really help blend the lateral orbit. Um, so you don't have a step off because how many times have you had patients come in their mid face cheeks look on point, their tear traps have been filled, but they have this like crazy, terrible step off laterally in their orbit. And you're like, well, their injector didn't know how to handle that. <laughs> Because it's tricky. I mean, the anatomy is tricky. So I make sure I show, you know, injectors how to blend that and then and then finish kind of softening and blending into the temple. So that's kind of the approach, girl. So I know like in your class, you teach about the product you use and like how you use like a blended uh, Rusty L that you teach there yeah. how to do the blending. Uh, what do you think about the new eye light that's coming out? I can't talk about a lot yet with the eye light. Um, I'm helping launch it with um, Gal Derma with the train the trainer. Um, it's going to be amazing. It's the same. It's the same product. It's Restylane mm -hmm. just in a smaller syringe. Um, and I will tell you that they are being very detailed about the launch of of it. They're being very careful about explaining anatomy and safety and how to avoid pitfalls and how to avoid getting past the orbital septum and how, how to place this product in a way that you're going to get amazing, beautiful results with minimal complication. I think it's great that it's in a smaller syringe, especially if you're just treating that area. Um, it does get a little tricky. I typically use the whole syringe because I'm doing full support everywhere. So I don't, I don't know how the small syringe is going to go. Um, but I think there's definitely value to it, especially for, for younger patients who don't need a lot of product, um, it's, you know, I, I've used wrestling under the eyes for seven, eight years now. And, um, I'll tell you, I've had like the minimal complications with wrestling compared to other products. I never use Bicross underneath the eyes. If you think about wrestling, you actually understand the rheology of the product. It is literally the perfect product for the tear trough. Because it has an incredible G prime. We all understand G prime, but what a lot of people don't know is how G prime is measured. And it's actually kind of interesting. They get the, a gel, a cube of gel, right? Which is your filler. They start out as these little cubes of gel, right? And then they're pushed through different sieves or cheese graters that kind of give you the different particle sizes. Restylane is a consistent particle size. Um, and it has a high G prime, which is measured as this little cube of gel. And then you, they get this like metal cube and put it on top of the gel cube and see how much compression that cube of gel can take until it completely splats out. Right. So that's a measurement of support, but also elasticity. Like how does that little guy stay together? Right. So wrestling has a pretty dang high G prime, which meaning, which means it's going to stay where you put it. And it also is going to provide a good amount of support and elasticity. It's going to stay together. So if, if you're trying to put it in an area where you don't want it to move, you don't want it to integrate. You want to keep it right where you put it. Wrestling is the perfect product. It's less than 1% cross-linked, meaning 
if you have an issue, it will dissolve immediately, unlike other products, because we understand Hylinex, the way Hylinex works is it actually breaks those cross-linking bonds, right? And then liquefies. So the, the more modified a product is, the more cross-linked the product is, the harder it is to dissolve. Restlin's less than 1%. So it's much safer. The reason why I dilute it or hydrate it, or whatever you want to call it, is I have noticed that it is a hyaluronic acid filler. It's hydrophilic. It draws in water, right? So I used to inject patients with straight product and they'd leave looking gorgeous and I'd fill to correction, but they'd come back looking overfilled. And I'm like, what did you do? Right? <laughs> it was completely my fault. I didn't understand <laughs> that these products pull water and sometimes never get rid of all of that. Right. So, um, I got worried and I started over I, I started like reconcentrating it with a full mill of NS with one mill of filler. And it was way too watered down. People needed multiple treatments to get a good result. And then I went to 0.5 cc's of NS, which is okay for some, some people, but not for most still needed to do a few sessions. And then I kind of slowly walked it down I typically do 0.2 cc's of NS. And I think that allows, I think like 0.1 to 0.2. It just hydrates it enough to where you can fill to correction, knowing that it's going to swell a little bit and draw some water, but it's also going to settle because you put NS in it, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've i noticed that if you, if you put 0.1 to 0.2 in it, 0.2 is kind of my typical... And filled to correction, they end up coming back looking almost identical as when they left, which is very predictable. I mix it out in a 3cc syringe and use the 3cc syringe to inject. So it's a lot more pressure, which controls the amount that you're pushing. So it's tiny little micro struts that you're injecting. It, it's very much like a micro injecting technique. It's it's just so predictable. And when if you can nail the location, it lasts so long. It really does. And I've had minimal complications with it. It really is a beautiful technique that you've developed. Do you want to talk a little bit about, I feel like sometimes people get confused between if they should use filler or if they use PRF under yeah. the eye. Do you want to talk about how you decide? Sure. Yeah. Filler is needed if volume is needed, right? I mean, keep it simple. PRF is beautiful. And um, we love PRF. We use tons of it, um, platelet rich fibrin for those who are not familiar. Um, I don't really, we don't use a ton of PRP in our practice anymore, um, mainly for joints now, um, mixed with our stem cell like exosome products. But um, PRF is beautiful for thickening the skin, right? If you've done a cadaver lab or if you're planning on going to one, take the time to try to dissect the skin off of the muscle underneath the eye. If you peel the skin off and look at it, it's literally translucent. You can see light going through it. It's so incredibly thin underneath the eyes. The, the skin around your orbit is the thinnest skin on the entire body. The upper eyelid is actually thinner than the or, lower eyelid. But um, PRF is one of the only things that can actually thicken your dermis and help with the skin color um, and texture because you're thickening it, but you're also allowing... Uh, less visualization of the, the vascular bed below, right? You can't see as much of the blood vessels because you've thickened the skin. So it helps with the coloring and the texture. Um, so often we'll layer, like I'll fill someone to correction with filler and then I will overfill them with PRF knowing the PRF is not going to give them volume over time. They'll look over volumized at first, but after a couple of weeks, they look phenomenal and they get the benefits of both. That's We have a lot of patients that fly in. So if I need to do it same day, I will. I typically prefer to space it out, mainly for recovery, just because of lymphatics. It's a sensitive area. But um, yeah, we love PRF. If they have volume loss and you can tell they're flattening, they don't have support. I mean, you could start with PRF if they're conservative, but at the end of the day, they need they need volume right? That's when you pull out your filler guns. I think it's a great explanation. Um, there is a question. I was going to hold them for the end, but this one kind of goes with what we're talking about. Have you ever used RHA under the eye? I mean, we carry multiple brands. It's just, mm -hmm. it's for me, I like, honestly, I hate the brand thing. It's less about the brand. It's more about the rheology of the product and actually mm -hmm. understanding it and like choosing something that works for that area. And it's such a tricky area that I've, I've tried everything I mean, I, we, I've tried a bunch of different products in Europe when I was there. We tried a bunch of different products in Canada. 
Um, we've demoed RHA and I've, I, I've tried um, the products. I just don't use it on the daily. Any advice you have for managing patient expectations? Oh my gosh. Yes. I think um, at RUMA, we we honestly just lay out things super clearly for patients. We we have this like annual plan where we um, lay out options for our patients for neuromodulators, dermal fillers, biostimulators, and PDO threads. And then we basically list out everything we talked about procedure-wise, what area, cost, duration, and then frequency, like when they would need to come back. And then on the back of the plan, it's month one, two, three, all the way to month 12. We lay out their whole entire plan, um, circle costs, like very clear about expectations, including like how often they're going to need to do something. It's not a one-time thing. Just being so clear with communication. Um, our patients get pre pre text before their appointments. Hey, you've booked 45 minutes. Make sure um, you don't have any contraindications. You are required to respond. If we don't get a response, your appointment will be canceled. Have you had any dental visits, vaccines, blah, blah, blah. Like all the things that would contraindicate the appointment so it doesn't waste your time, but it also gives them um, kind of that opportunity to think about their health too. Expectation wise, we also go over before care, we send them before care ahead of time. We've created a drop, like a drop page on our website where patients can go in and read everything they need to know about their procedure that they're having done. Um, and then we send that to them again after that goes over all their aftercare. I think you just have to learn to over communicate with your patients because they don't remember. Mm-hmm. So you have to document it. You have to have a trail. So if we text them through our system, there's like a a chain of all these messages. So if the patient's like, I didn't get that. You're like, "Mm, mm -hmm." we send that to you like three times. So go check your messages. And, you know, I think you just have to be so clear. Cost is a big thing. We're super upfront about costs. We post it on our website. If they can afford it, I don't, I don't want them to come in and be embarrassed if they can't afford it. Right. And that also is wasting my time, my team's time, my assistants, like we could have gotten someone else in on our wait list. So I think you just have to be super clear and open about everything. So you started, I think, in a one room injecting room, right? When you went on your own. Yeah. Yeah. And now you've like outgrown one huge build out and like you're on to another big, um, really big practice. Yeah. What was maybe like the biggest roadblock you feel like uh, from going from being employee to doing this on your own? I would say protecting myself and my business. Because you you transition from being an employee to being a boss, and you've never done that before, right? Maybe you have, but not in that capacity. So I made a couple of big mistakes with just assuming, and this is something I love about myself, but I think assuming the best in people and in processes and in companies. And at the end of the day, my company now supports 30 families. Wow. So I have to support the business. I have to protect the business, right? So when something happens and you haven't protected the business and your business takes a hit, that affects everybody. So I think like one of the most important things is investing in really good coaching, finding a mentor, protecting yourself contractually, um, making sure everybody is on a good contract where it's like open and you've communicated that to them because I I, I left one of my practices because they try to make me sign a non-compete. And it's not because they, it's not because of the non-compete. I would have signed it. Um, it was how it was presented to me. Um, they froze my schedule, didn't allow me to see patients until I signed it. So it was forceful and not respectful. And mm-hmm. So I think if you sit down and as you're growing a team, I think the most challenging thing is like growing an amazing team. And I, culture is so important to me and quality and safety at Ruma. I have been so careful about growing our team and we have such a phenomenal team right now. I'm so, so grateful. Um, But it has been so painful to build that. And I think that anyone who started a business, that you understand that this is painful. Like we are taking shots every day, constantly, right? And so 
you just have to protect yourself. And and I would recommend having your your entire staff on contracts that list out your expectations and like non-competes if it's necessary in your state, but what's more important is a non-solicitation, protecting your patients, a non-solicitation, a non-solicitation for employment. So your your employees can't leave and take your employees. <laughs> that happened. Yeah, like learning from other people. I have tried to reach out and I have many mentors. I'm in many mastermind groups. And um, I've I've been able to avoid a lot of heartache and a lot of problems, but I've gone through plenty of that myself too. Like as a provider and a business owner in our industry, not like being guided on how to run a business. It's terrifying. So we have created like contracts that we sell to providers like 1099s with non-competes and non non-solicitations and all these protective words and <laughs> statements that protect your business, but matter. Like if you're an employee that you um, hire to launch a part of your business and then they create that for you and then they leave and then they try to create that for themselves, like that's not okay. And you need to protect yourself contractually. So that doesn't happen to you. That's happened to me twice. So you can't assume that people are going to stay in line. That's the sad thing. Like people are always going to watch out for number one. And at the end of the day, my business supports not only my family, which is uh, like incredibly important, but now we support 30 other families. So now I'm like mother bear for everybody. And you better believe I'm going to protect this business. So I think that's like probably then the most challenging thing because that's not something we're taught in school. Mm -hmm. You know? For sure. Well, I say business and ownership, uh, entrepreneurship, it's more of a personal development journey than <laughs> anything because you're going to be forced to grow in ways that you didn't know that you even develop maybe some haters just because it seems like you have got really popular really fast. Mm -hmm. um, how yeah. do you, uh, any tips you say for people like maybe dealing with? I just ignore them, to be honest. I think I've only engaged a couple of times and the only time I ever really engage is when they are hating on someone else on my team. Mm -hmm. Like I, the mother bear comes out a little bit. Yeah. Like we, I don't know. I posted a, a reel on um, hair restoration and then we're like doing a slow-mo of like flipping our hair around me and Chrissy, one of our NPs on our team. And this woman who's an injector and owns her own practice, mother of three, um, <laughs> messages us oh that's for sure extensions i hate how these famous injectors are ruining our industry like just so rude just unnecessary comments so i just got on my instagram stories and like peeled back my scalp i'm like oh does anyone see extensions i i, I don't know <laughs> so i think it's important to like put people in their place sometimes if it needs to happen chrissy is the sweetest human ever and she's never going to go after anybody and i was like how dare you like are you kidding me? You you don't know us. Like so most of the time I delete it. I hate I I I don't even think twice about it because honestly, they're probably just so miserable themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. you know, they're just they're unhappy. They're spending their time to comment like a child on your video. Like I don't give them the time of day. The only time I do is when they hurt my people. And you better believe I'm gonna go after them if that happens. <laughs> No, that's good. Just don't engage unless you have to. If you had just one thing you could tell someone, because something you said earlier was that, you know, that at one point you wanted to quit, which I think, you know, is like looking at you from the, an outsider is like, whoa, Shelby Miller wanted to quit. Like, you know, because uh, I think when you get kind of to the level you are like, that just seems like, you know, I can't even fathom that. What maybe like one piece of advice you have for someone that maybe they're a year in and they, you know, you do you say some days you think, oh, I love this. Other days, like, should I go back to me doing what I was doing before? Um, any just like your best actionable advice for someone who's maybe in the building phase, um, you're trying to get new clients. Like what's one piece of advice you'd like to give? I think you need to learn from as many people as you possibly can. So you're going to have these people that you think are amazing. And you're like, oh my gosh, I want to learn from them. Go learn from them. But learn from a bunch of other people too. Because yes, like understanding anatomy is super important. But at the end of the day, it's, it's extremely artistic what we do, right? So I think you need to find people that create results that are beautiful and natural. But vet those people too. And make sure that they're actually trained and good and know their anatomy. Um, 
and go go learn from them. And from a business standpoint, go shadow people. Oh my gosh, we have people shadow us at Ruma all the time. It's so fun. And I'm like very open and I kind of show them everything because it's like, I got nothing to hide. And if I can save someone two years of, of stress, like, oh my gosh, come shadow me at Ruma. It's so fun. Um, I see patients Tuesday through Friday. There's a lot of availability. We always shadow. We always have people shadowing. I've shadowed tons of my colleagues. It's really good to see their flow, how it works, how you're uh, how you're structuring the patient touch points, right? Where are your inefficiencies? How can you make more money? How can you make your life easier by hiring some support staff and not being afraid of that? We have an aesthetic assistant apprenticeship program and training program for injector assistants because we have dialed in that entire process. I always work with two, maybe three assistants. Um, and I like almost tripled my revenue doing that just me. So being like, and my job's more enjoyable because I'm not doing any of the extra crap that I shouldn't be doing. Like what can you and only you be doing and everything else you need to delegate that. So you need to learn like how to structure that and how to let go of control and learn from other practices that are freaking killing it. And so you can save so much of your time. So trainings are great. Like actual technique trainings are great, but I think shadowing is even more valuable for business owners. Agree. Just to see the inside of how someone else runs their business. I know like you, your assistants, like I was just amazed, like, wow, like they have their job down so well to where they've just, they have you positioned for just ready to inject when you walk in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I love that. Do you think there's anything coming that's like really going to change the industry? I know we've talked about ultrasound. Uh, we've talked about, you know, your stem cells, like what uh, you think is maybe one thing that's going to be like a big industry changer. I think the biggest one's ultrasound now, but that's like a, a big hill for someone to climb. Um, but it's not a mountain. So like get on your horse and go up the hill, like get a freaking ultrasound, especially now I helped, I helped recover this, um, insane temple occlusion over the weekend um but just a few weeks ago i had my first radius vascular event which was terrifying and um i'm injecting so i started in one room when i started ruma right one tiny little room 10 by 12 120 square feet i it was in this beauty bar where the owners had this nail salon hair salon boutique um in like a full retail area and then they had one little room in the back that wasn't being used and then they had one other little area where they had an esthetician and my client becky who owned this place is is like the kindest human ever and said come over i'm not even gonna charge you rent so i was in that room for 18 months and she didn't let me pay her a dime for rent the entire time she just wanted my clientele in the building because if they could pay for botox they could pay for all the other things there um but she became a dear friend. I'm injecting her three weeks ago and I'm on the posterior, well, kind of like right through here on the mandible. And I palpated where her angular artery was. I had her bite down. I located it. I knew exactly where the artery was. And I was about a centimeter behind it doing a a tiny like 0.05 bolus of radius on bone. And I finish injecting and her whole face goes completely white on that side of the face. And I was using radius. And this woman has become like a family to me. So I am, I was surprised at how calm I was, but it was extremely terrifying. Luckily, two days earlier, I had done an ultrasound, advanced ultrasound complications course with Leone. Shelky, who's from the Netherlands, and she's incredible. And she runs a complications clinic um, that she utilized ultrasound for. Her research is phenomenal. And luckily, I had created a relationship with her because initially I had no idea how to treat this. The arteries were painting. I had no idea what was going on. Um, It was a complete vascular spasm event. All of her skin was affected. I didn't know what to do. So I flooded it with a couple of vials of Hylinex. It looked kind of improved, but I'm like, this is radius. Like I can't, can't really do a crazy amount to it. So I end up sending the patient home, follow up with photos. It looks worse and worse, like impending necrosis. Just at that, it went from white to just reticular purple lacy all the way up through here. Her lower lip was affected, upper lip, 
nasolabial piriform up the side of, uh, side of her nose, kind of up to the corner of her eye. It's so bad. So I end up FaceTiming Leone. Luckily, she was available. I get her on FaceTime. I have the patient meet me back here at 1 a.m. in the morning because I'm just like, we got to do something. Like, this is so bad. I was looking so bad. So she helped me identify on ultrasound where the microvascularization was completely cut off. And that is the problem. It doesn't matter where the product is. It was a choke phenomenon. It's a spasm. So to treat that, you have to locate where there's no microvascularization to the dermis. And she showed me, it's kind of tricky, but once you, once you see it, it like makes total sense. So we locate the area, which was basically down here, like about an inch anterior to where I put the product. So I have my probe over this area and there's no blood flow vertically to the dermis. There's no tiny little microvat. There's no perforators to the dermis. It's quiet, but all around it is bruised and everywhere else is hypervascularized. So she has me go in with Hylinex and go just above and below the SMAS and subsect the SMAS off of that superficial layer with, I don't know, I think I use like 60 units of Hylinex, not even half a vial. And, and I keep it on, I keep my probe on there. So I'm watching the screen and you can literally see the microvasculature just bloop, wake, wake, wake right up. And all of that reticular pattern within like 10 minutes was completely gone. And she was just bruised. It was insane. Like the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I, I, I would have never been able to locate that if I didn't have a nice ultrasound. My patient, she would have necrosed. Um, it was so bad. And I documented all of it. I have videos of it. I have pictures of it. And I'm going to present it at Aesthetic Next in the fall. And um, so my patient didn't even necro. She didn't even get blisters, like nothing with from radius, a, a, like insane vascular event. So I think that the the industry needs to hear more of these stories and needs to know her her research because her research isn't not not well accepted in the United States. Unfortunately, she believes that we don't often inject interarterial. That most of it is a vascular spasm event. It, it has to do with the hyaluron receptors and how the hyalinex affects that. The hyalinex did not dissolve anything. It, it's the chemical activity of the hyalinex that helps wake up the microvasculature, which is basically all of her research. And she's treated almost 400 patients this way in her complications clinic and all resolved beautifully. I think that we need to start thinking like outside of the box and instead of flooding the area with 22, 40 vials of hyalinex, which can be extremely harmful for your patient. Mm -hmm. We need to be smarter and like listen to the people that are doing this day in, day out in other countries and collaborate. Get out of your comfort zone, buy a freaking $20,000 ultrasound and protect your patients and treat this like a medical procedure and have the tools to fix complications because they're going to happen. When I mean, when I'm injecting, I have 5,000 patients, like I'm going to have issues, mm -hmm. right? I'm constantly injecting like four days a week. You're going to have complications. And if you don't have those tools, like my patients, my, my, like dear friend's face would have just had scarring and to drive this home over the weekend, I get a call temple occlusion, insane temple occlusion. It's been four days, four days. They call me. I'm at my cabin, but I play Leone's role. I'm on FaceTime. They're showing me the ultrasound and I'm like, okay, we're going to find where there's no blood flow to the microvascular, like where there's no microvascularization. We scan the whole area. I'm like, where did you inject? Let's start there. We find exactly where she has a significant amount of HA, RHA4, in the SMAS, in the temple, in the superficial temporal fascia, which is compressing her artery, causing this microvascular issue. And you find the area of microvascularization where there's no blood flow. And that's where she put the hyalinex and boom, wakes right back up. The reticular pattern resolves after like 10, 15 minutes on the patient and she just looks bruised. It's insane. It works. It's crazy. So I think that we just need to like get comfortable being uncomfortable and learn. And I think that honestly, I think ultrasound is kind of the future right now. There's going to always be new products coming out. There's going to be always be new FDA indications, but we're already injecting all these areas anyways off label. Right. I think what's coming is like, how do we optimize safety? How do we optimize results? How do we think outside the box? I think our generation is 
different. Like we don't accept the status quo. We want details. We want answers. We want to know why we were the annoying ones asking all the questions Mm -hmm. that all the injectors that have been doing this for 20 plus years that have kind of somewhat come compliant, like just they've had great results for so long that that's just how they do things. Like we need to get past that, you know? And luckily so many of our colleagues are like continually learning. And we have so many amazing leaders that have been doing this for so long and are always continuously learning and sharing their complications and what they lo- they've they learned. And I think we just need to do more of that. What do you have in your lips right now? They look amazing. I just got them done. They're huge. They're so swollen right now. <laughs> <laughs> they look good. Um, we just did wrestling. I always do wrestling. They look really good. They're so swollen and bruised, but you know. <laughs> In five days. I'm so reactive to I have to take prednisone every time. Well, you've given so much value. I feel like all from business to um, clinical. And when that's the great thing about you, I feel like, you know, some people are really good at clinical or really good at business. And you're one of those unicorns that yeah. really can dominate in, in both. But um, yeah. Girl, I'm learning. I'm still learning. We all are, right? Anything else before we close? No, thanks for having me. This is oh, so, thank you. so honored. Thank you. Thank you for, for thinking of me. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure.